Advanced visualization, and here's the first question. Shoot. And always speak in the mic. Okay. Uh, actually, uh, I just want to know, uh, so do we have the final exam? Um, I would like to make this class an entirely project-oriented class and research-oriented class. And therefore, the last project, project number four, is your project anyway, which is much more complicated than the first three, right? The last project is you defining a project, you presenting a project, you writing about your project, and you programming your project. So therefore, that, that's enough. Unless there is strong demand that students would like for me to make up a final exam, I will be happy to do that. Who has, who has a real strong urge to have me give a final exam? No one, OK. All right. A anyway, I mean, uh, it's much more to your benefit if I allow you to really define a very cool final project right? that comes from you and you like it and exciting also relates, if possible, to your research. Right? That, that's, that's why I do that. Um, I used to give exams before, but they don't really serve any purpose. You do a research-oriented final project, it serves a much bigger purpose. Okay. Uh, all right, so where are we? Are there any questions tonight regarding organizational things? Shoot. So I had two questions. The first one was um, for project one. Mm -hmm. uh, you talk about the difference, the numerical difference and the image differences. How many differences do you want in, in the final project? Well, one, one more time, I didn't get that. I mean, I haven't even talked yet about the first project. Right, so you talk about your program should support both numerical comparisons and the visual comparison. Mm -hmm. How many comparisons do you I, I will talk about the project. Okay, but, but when it comes to discussing the first project, I will go over that. Uh, line by line, explain everything what I have in mind, okay? Not, not today. But uh, because I haven't even touched on the material yet, what actually the first project is all about. So, But it's good that you're eager to get going. So. Um, all right, data sets. Uh, we need data sets, right, for the stars to make the pictures. Um, it will be best if you start for all your assignments, and this is just a rule of thumb, okay? That's when I do my own programming and want to understand whether I'm actually doing something of uh, meaning and something that actually works. I define a very simple function. I define a very simple data set myself. And first make sure that my pictures make sense and are correct for the most simple function that I can think of f of x, y, z equals x plus y plus z. f of x, y, z equals x squared plus y squared plus z squared. Something very simple. And I sample that thing on a nice Cartesian grid, and I try to make pictures, right? And if my implementation of some algorithm actually produces meaningful pictures for such a simple data set, then there is hope that it actually produces meaningful pictures for complicated stuff, right? So always force yourself, I guess this is a general rule of thumb, always force yourself to begin testing and debugging your program with very simple data that you understand. Okay? Uh, there's always a tendency to jump at the tornado data set right away or to jump at that combustion data set right away. But that stuff is so complicated. You make pretty pictures no matter what. Right? And they look cool. And you just don't know whether it's just art or whether it's science. Right? So, so uh, in, order, uh, in order to convince me when I look at your programs, right? you, you demonstrate all your programs to me, you have to show me snapshots image captures of very simple stuff. Otherwise, I cannot believe anything, right? The data is just too complex. You cannot assume that I will understand whether your algorithm, your implementation, your pictures are correct. Can't do that. So you have to show me something of spherical shells, straight lines, planes, where I see, OK, well, if he applies or she applies the algorithm to some simple stuff, the right image comes, comes out. Okay, And then you show me the real stuff on tornadoes and oceans and atmospheres and all of that. Data sets, again, there is this one a public domain data set which uh, provides data. That is uh, walrus.org. You can go there. And uh, Kate, can you give me a favor? You. Uh, Tell me next time where we also have a public, uh, publicly available uh, open uh, library of data sets for scientific visualization. OK, the, the web the website next time on Tuesday. So we share that with everyone in class to get additional data sets. This is yeah. enough, OK? This should be enough. But if there is some, something else that uh, you can let me know, then I'll also share that. OK? Um, again, 
also you yourself have access to all kinds of research data sets you're already working with, right? So by all means, you can use those data sets for your own projects and final projects, no problem. Um, books. There are two great books that I want to highlight. Um, one book is actually on this list that I gave you last time. Um, those of you who really like the mathematical aspects of this whole area of visualization and computer graphics, uh, the equations, the geometry, the modeling, the approximation, the interpolation, uh, uh, you would really love this book by Jared Farron. It's called Computer Aided Geometric Design. And even though it is primarily uh, meant for uh, computer aided design of aircraft and car bodies and ships, things like that, uh, all the techniques in it also apply to the problems you have in scientific visualization. So this, if, if you like the uh, uh, more mathematically oriented things or geometrical oriented things, this is a great investment. And I, I let this go around so you can uh, copy this t and see how the books look like. And you can check it out in the bookstore or the library. There's another book which is really good for those of you who are really interested in ray casting. Hmm? It turns out that uh, this area or this field that was um, initiated in uh, computer graphics or visualization called volume visualization or ray casting, this is really a subfield within uh, thermal radiation, heat transfer, uh, waves, optics, optical phenomena of waves penetrating certain translucent media. Okay, that's where that comes from. And so um, this area or the theory of um, ray casting is really a very, very small specialty within heat transfer. And so there is a much older discipline, hundreds of years old, where people have already studied how certain waves of different wavelengths are penetrating different types of materials, homogeneous, heterogeneous, etc., etc. And the phenomena that one really has to model if one wants to do it correctly, then its absorption, its scattering, its emission, its reflection, its multiple wavelengths, all kinds of stuff. Okay? Very complicated, much more complicated than any of the uh, uh, ray casting papers that you have read. But why do I say that? If you want to improve the current state of the art in ray casting or ray tracing volume rendering, then those of you guys who are interested in that, uh, this is a wonderful book that you should, should at least look at and check out. And it's called uh, uh, Thermal Radiation Heat Transfer. It's the standard textbook. It's like in the fifth edition now. And it's uh, uh, written by uh, Robert Siegel. Wonderful book. Okay, It's, of course, a thousand pages thick. No? And, and, and the part that actually talks about the relevant stuff for, for ray casting is maybe 100 pages. Okay? But again, there is so much in there uh, for you to pick up, get excited about, to make ray casting better. And so those of you guys, I don't know, who really would like to uh, uh, do ray casting volume rendering for, your, for, your, for, for, your, for, for making money, for earning a living, this would be the book that you need to read. Hmm? And also, uh, if you check it out for your final project, you want to do a raycasting project, then also maybe you get inspired by some of the things discussed in there. Should No? OK. All right. So I said, I assume that all of you already have a very good understanding of at least computer graphics, right? You have to be very good at computer graphics programming. You don't need to write a library of computer graphics, but you need to be able to use a library like OpenGL or whatever library it is that you like. Right? You have to assume that. Mm, beyond that, I also assume that ideally you have already done some uh, basic visualizations, visualization, algorithm design, and Im implementation, and testing for three-dimensional data, uh, because I have to build on that when I talk about the mathematics, right, to make these pictures better. But I want to assume that some of you would benefit from me providing a little refresher about the essence of visualization techniques. And I said there are just three, right? There are just three methods in visualization that everything can, can be uh, reduced to, essentially. Three basic approaches to making pictures of volume data. Those three approaches are? Should. Basic visualization techniques. So this is my review, right? You know all of this already. Review uh, basics about this, basic this methods. I mean, this is my subjective view, right, of the world. 
that there are only three methods that one really needs to understand well. What, what might these methods be? Please help me. Jennifer, right? Yeah. Okay. Ray casting. Ray casting is a good one, yes. It's already a more complicated one, right? Good, that's one. What's another one? Uh, slicing. Slicing, yes, that's, that's the ba most basic one, yeah. And what might the third one be? Slicing, going with a plane through a domain. Ray casting, right? Shooting rays in there, or following rays, going through a solid. And then what's the other one? x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals 5. Is it contours? It's a contour. Yeah. It's an isosurface, right? Those are the three most important visualization techniques. And nearly all techniques can be reduced to that for scalar fields, for volume visualization, okay? Volume data. Trivariate, single valued volume data can be visualized with those basic techniques. And then they can be generalized. So there are three essential techniques. Number one is slicing. And then there are the different versions, right? If you are slicing through a two-dimensional grid or you are slicing through the, through the volume grid, right? So and those are cut lines or cutting lines or cut planes, right? Slicing planes. So you use um, um, cut lines or cut planes in a volume data set. As the means to actually uh, obtain the slices. Part two was contouring, computing contours, contouring. And the results of contouring are, well, over the plane they are called isolines, and in, in space over the volume they are called isosurfaces, right? So the output here are isolines or uh, ISO curves, and here it's ISO uh, surfaces. Mm -hmm. ISO lines, ISO curves, right? What is the best term? I guess ISO curves is a better one. Mm -hmm. uh, three uh, is ray casting. Ray casting. Or sometimes called volume rendering, right? Volume rendering, ray casting is used uh, interchangeably. Volume rendering. Okay. Um, let's review the essence of uh, slicing again. Slicing. This is just to remind us about the essence of these algorithms. So let's say I just explained for 2D first. In 2D, the most simple way to deal with the meshed data set would be uh, a triangle mesh. Okay, uh, what else do I have? Well, I have the connectivity and then I have the individual data. And the data in 2D would be, of course, points and function values. And then if I have uh, a cut line, a slicing, uh, a slicing line, then, well, I want to understand what is this function when I cut this triangular mesh with a line. And I can then visualize right, the function restricted to this segment from there to there. I either can use a color map to actually give this line a color, or since I have additional space to draw, I could evaluate the function that I know at certain locations here. And then at these locations, I would compute values. And afterwards, if I were to use this direction, say, to indicate function value, I could show this something like that, right? Either you encode the behavior of the function along the slicing element by color, Goro shading, or if you have the drawing uh, freedom, you can show it as a curve in this case, or as a surface over a cut plane. OK, so this is the uh, 2D case. 
Um, what is the uh, uh, analog 3D case? Well, in 2D, the simplest element that we can cut is a triangle. What is the simplest element that we can cut or slice in 3D? Tell me, shoot, you know it. Jennifer? A tetrahedron. A tetrahedron. Mm -hmm. So in 3D, we have our domain XYZ. And if I just draw one of the elements, the simplest element, then I have a tetrahedron. Okay. What is the data that I have in this case? I have points. Now they have three spatial coordinates and one dependent variable, right? X, Y, Z, F. And now I have a slicing plane in 3D, and that slice is plane through, well, the entire set of tetrahedra that I have. And say if my, um, if my, uh, should draw this actually slightly differently, should start with the slicing plane first to indicate that we are slicing. So we are slicing in 3D space with a plane. The space plane goes up and down and is happily intersecting one of our tetrahedra. Okay. Then I get this intersection between the cut plane and the tetrahedron, and the points would be my points x, i, y, i, z, i, f, i, all right, again, how do I show the function, uh, which is the fourth dimension, right? The function is dimension four. How do I show the function in the cut plane by doing a Garot shading, right? I can Garot shade a color, a color map, the function value, into that plane. In order to do that, I also need to evaluate on another grid, right, the function on that plane. In order to give it a color huh, and paint it, I need to evaluate the function also here, right? I need to get function values in the cut plane everywhere, right? So the pat pla cut plane is going through all the tetrahedra. When it goes through the interior of a particular tet, I have to f I have s a bunch of sample points inside the tet, and I have to have a means to get values there, right? OK. So this is the cut plane, which is uh, Goro shaded, say, Goro shaded based on function value, shaded um, based on function FCT value. So that's all there is to slicing. Right? And you have done this before, right? Going to a three dimensional domain. Can you slice more generally? Are there generalizations of this that you could implement? Instead of having a cut line, what is the generalization of the line? You could have a cut curve. Huh? Why not? Why are you interested in the behavior of the function just along the line? You might be interested in the behavior of the function along a curve. Right? In 3D, do you have to cut the domain with a plane necessarily? No. You also might be interested in seeing how the function behaves on concentric shells. Huh? So you could also slice in 3D, not using a plane, but having a bunch of spheres, right? Shrinking and growing. Huh? So cut lines could become cut curves, and slicing planes could become slicing surfaces. Huh? For example, if you have a phenomenon defined in, in the interior of the Earth, right, it might make more sense to see uh, the variable mapped onto spherical shells. Right? If, if your domain is indeed a box, well, the box has planes, right, as boundaries. But if you have a globe or the Earth, well, it has a spherical boundary, so you won't have shells, right? Maybe. All right. So, but the uh, most important aspect there is the following. You are only given in your input data set these function values, right? The values at the corners of your mesh elements, in this case triangles, and that doesn't suffice. In order to come up with the values here, huh? you need to do what? You 
need to estimate estimate uh, function values, FCT values, for the sample points where you want to render this thing. For sample points. Sample points P and T S. How do we do that? The only thing that you need to understand to do in graphics visualization and geometric modeling is Jennifer? Interpolation. And the only type of interpolation that matters and that we need is linear interpolation. That's all we need, right? So therefore we need to review how to do linear interpolation. How would we do linear interpolation over the triangle here? Where do we have the data given? The data is given at these mesh points, right? How do I do linear interpolation along this line? Two steps, right? If I want to get the value here, what do I need to do? Well, this line here intersect the triangle in these two edges. So I need to get this value and that value, no matter what. And then I have the value here and there. And then I interpolate linearly this guy and this guy to get that guy. Okay? So it always is linear interpolation. Hmm? All right. So we need to review that. This is a necessary, the most necessary scheme in all of graphics, necessary uh, module is linear interpolation, all that we need. And I just call it linint, OK? I don't have to spell it out. Linear interpolation. Uh, linear interpolation goes through all the dimensions, right? 1D, 2D, 3D, 4D. So we only need to understand for 1D, 2D, 3D, and the rest is by mm, induction. All right, so let's see. The 1D case, how do I do that? Um, maybe I can do it like that. 3D case, 2D case, and 1D case. 1D, 2D, 3D refers to the number of variables we have. In the simplest way, in the simplest case, we have just one direction x, and we have two values at location circle, circle with function values, bullet, bullet. And I call this maybe location A, location B. And I want to evaluate at some arbitrary location x. And I need the value f of, of x. OK, what is the value f of x? Well, your i sees that. Your i sees that there exists this line. And your i sees that that is the value at this triangle location. OK, so what is f of x mathematically? Actually, let me call this better x0 and x1. And I can call this value f0 and f1. And this value here is f. OK, so how do I get f from f0 and f1? f at x is a combination of the left values, right? It's a combination of the left value, f0, plus something times the right value, f1. And what is the stuff in front of it? You remember that, or you derive it? OK, I call it x, so. Just replace t with x in your mind. So. Obviously, you divide by something, right? You have to divide by something here, maybe? x1 minus x0 first. OK, so I give that away. And what goes into the numerator? Be brave. Tell me something for this guy. x minus? All right. Uh, x1 minus x. Who? x1 minus x. Yes, that's the winner. x1 minus x. And therefore, what goes here? x minus x0. OK? Yeah, x minus x0. That's hard to remember. Therefore, I don't remember it this way. I remember it like this. I remember that this length here has a length, and I call this length L0. And this one has a length here, this interval, right? And call this length L1. Huh? So the length closest to F0 I call L1. The length closest to F1 I call L0, opposite index. And then I can just say, this is uh, L0 over L0 plus L1 times F0 
plus uh, L1 divided by L0 plus L1 times F1. Okay. Linear interpolation for a line. Now in 2D, um, my data lives in a triangle, lives in a plane. So I have this problem. I have, I'm given a triangle with corner values. Right? So this guy might be corner 2, corner 2 with function value 2. This might be corner 1, 1 with function value 1. All right? And I need, say, the value here. What is the value there? The generalization of this thinking is to do this. Okay, this point where I need a value there subdivides my triangle into three subtriangles. And so if this guy is called point zero, okay, then you remember this, right? You always give the index from the opposite vertex to the opposing area. So this triangle has a certain area, and I call this area zero. This one I call area two, and this one I call area one. Okay, it's opposite to the vertex, no? the indexing. And so what is the value there at this location P? That's where I need a value. Um, so the value F at P is, a lo is a, uh, the value at some location x, y. And that one. And now it becomes a nice generalization of this thing. Now it is just area A0 over something times function value 0 plus area 1 times function value 1 plus area 2 times function value 2. And here I had to add up the two length. Here I have to add up the three areas. Okay, So that's how I can remember this. A0 plus A1 plus A2. A0 plus A1 plus A2. And A0 plus A1 plus A2. Okay. So this is the important part. The interesting uh, formula. Here we have the same scheme, and now it becomes obvious how this generalizes to a tet or tetrahedron. In the 3D case, we have our data living in 3D space x, y, z, and our most primitive element in 3D would be a tet. And now we have uh, four given data. And so let's say this guy is number 3, x3, y3, z3, and function value 3. This one is, say, the, sec, uh, the first one, x1, y1, z1, and function value 1, and so forth. And this one might be the first, x0, y0, z0, and function value 0. So this guy is number 2. And now I need to evaluate somewhere in the interior, right? So my interior point where I need a value say, is this guy, point inside that tet. And again, then I can connect the corners of the tet with this uh, point where I need a value. And I subdivide the big parent tet into how many children? Four, right? So a line gets split into two children, two sublines. A triangle gets split into three children sub-triangles and the volume, the tet gets split into four. So that goes on throughout the dimensions. So, and I need a function value here at this location P. I call it the location P. So now I need a value at P. And P is a location with three coordinates, x, y, and z. And this formula goes over just by going one dimension up. Instead of having three terms, I will have four terms. In, instead of talking about areas, I will talk about volumes. And instead of having to add up three sub-areas, I will have to add up four sub-volumes. Okay, and then you see how that goes on. So this is, uh, I just write down the first term. So this is volume one, volume zero, over the volume zero plus volume one plus volume two plus volume three times the first corner function value plus blah, 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 two more. And then the last one will be the value number three 
times, well, the volume number 3 over all the volumes. Volume 0 plus volume 1 plus volume 2 plus volume 3. Okay, And again, these V values are the volumes of these little baby tetrahedra in, 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 in inside the big uh, parent tetrahedron. So V is for volume. Here A is for area. And here L is for the length of the signs, right? And now you go, can go from this 1D case to the 2D case to the 3D case to all the cases, right? All right. This is all we need. This is really all we need to understand for linear interpolation, and we are set. Any questions so far? It's clear, right? Okay. So this was just necessary, right? Okay. All right. Enough said about that. Um, now we are done with slicing and cutting. We're done with that. This is the technique that's all you need to understand, right? You have slicing elements, slicing lines, or slicing planes. You sample, you sample your slicing elements with points, these points, right? And then you need to evaluate at these sample points. And here's the magic that you use over and over again to sample on a line or to sample in a cut plane. That's it. And then you can do slicing. Um, then there are variations of that. Now we come to the next important one, very important one that is contouring. Number two is contouring. Contouring. Um, I just do or we remind ourselves how this works by just looking at a concrete example. Um, example, I just give you in the xy plane a mesh, right, a 2D mesh, and then the contour will be a polygon, I guess. And let's do the following. I just give you a bunch of little happy squares. Okay, not enough. I also want to... Uh, that's too many squares. I don't like these big examples when they go out of hand too much. Uh, the principles can be explained more simply. Uh, much smaller mesh. A nice simple triangle mesh. Okay, that triangle mesh is given. Uh, this is a valid triangle mesh. It's a little bit awkward there, but that's okay. And I have function values here. So I just say um, circle means uh, 0 and bullet means 1. Okay, And I want to have the contour value uh, for threshold t equals 1 half. Okay. All right, so I just do this randomly. Bullet, circle, bullet, bullet, circle, circle, bullet, bullet, circle. Okay, so where's the contour for one half? There are two steps to, er to any contouring algorithm, right? First, you find a bunch of points on the contour, on the edges, and then you connect them somehow to get a mesh, right? So where are points? How do you get points that lie in the contour t equals one half? If this is zero and this is zero, is there a contour point there? Yes or no? No? Why not? Because you always say, burnt, all we do is linear interpolation, right? All right, so when you interpolate 0 and 0, what is the value along the entire line? 0. There is no intersection with t equals 1 half, right? All right, so Burnt says all you need is linear interpolation. We do linear interpolation on all the edges. If this is a 0 and this is a 1, then where's 1 half? One half is at the middle, right? This is what I've shown in this example. So there can only be intersections with a contour if one endpoint has a value smaller than one half and the other endpoint is larger than one half, right? So that's the first check you do. For all the edges, determine can they have contour point, yes or no? 
those that can have a point, compute the point, right? All right, so this guy can have a point, namely there. This guy can have a point, namely there. This guy can have a point, namely there. He has a point. Uh, this cannot have a point. Um, he has a point. Um, this is a point. Zero, one, he has a point. Zero, one, he has a point. And zero, one, he has a point. And zero, one, he has a point. And I think I got them all, right? These are the points on the contour, one half. Now what do you do? Is this the result for rendering? No, now what do you do next? Now you connect them, right? How do you connect them? You connect two of these guys when they are on edges belonging to the same triangle, okay? So therefore, you connect this and this, this and this, this and this, this and this and that, right? So you have this contour line, or contour polygon. Okay, done. Well, done with part of the point set. You have more. Okay, now you also have this guy and this guy. Well, there's one way to connect them, namely that way. Boom. And then you have this pair, and you connect them like that. Okay, so that's, that's the result. That's a contour for a triangle mesh, a semi linear variation of the function over each edge. Okay, uh, so there are three steps there. First, uh, determine all the edges that can contain a contour. Find edges uh, with a contour point. Okay. Step two, you compute the ac the actual location of that lo uh, of that point. Um, find location. Find location of uh, each contour point. And once you have done that, then the last step is you connect them to get the, these polygons, right? Step three is you connect them, connect these guys, connect uh, the points. And that's it. That's all there is to contouring, whether it's uh, contour lines or whether it's contour surfaces, the same principle in 3D. All right. So I explained the principle there for a triangle, because the triangle is the simplest creature there is, right? And in 3D, the simplest creature there is as a mesh element is a tetrahedron. So I will also do it for a tetrahedron, right? Uh, 3D case, uh, tetrahedron example. OK. if we determine a contour surface, a contour mesh for a tetrahedron, then our uh, data set already lives in 3D space, and here is a habitat, one of several million tetrahedra, and at the corners we have function values, say I have uh, 4, 4, 4, 1, I just show the values, and then I want to have the contour for Threshold t equals one. No, I cannot do that. Let me give this guy value zero. So where, where's where's the contour for zero? Same thing, right? We apply the same steps, the same three steps. Which are the edges that can contain a contour point? Only this edge, this edge, and this edge, right? So therefore, now I do linear interpolation. This is zero. This is four. So where's one? Zero, four. There's two. There's one, right? Huh? So I get this point. So this is 0, this is 4, so here it's 2, and that's 1, right? Something like that. 0, 4, so here it is 2, so it is 1 there, right? That's it. I get three points. And now comes step 3. I have to consider the entire set of contour points, only have 3. And for each set that, that lie on the edges of the same tet, I connect them in a poly polygonal fashion. So I take this guy, take that guy, take that guy. And there's my contour triangle, right? That's it. Done. And you do this for all the elements. So here's your uh, triangle. So, um, but you can also can also uh, obtain uh, 
quads, quadrilaterals, okay? What do I mean? This is a triangle. When you are slicing a tetrahedron, no, no, it's not slicing. When you're computing the contour inside a tetrahedron, you can get triangles or quadrilaterals. Why is that? I give you the, I give you one example of a quadrilateral intersection of the contour with the tet. So how can I do that? This is a possibility too. Hmm? Where you have actually four intersection points. And now I make up the values after the fact, okay? So, um, this might be zero, this might be four still. Um, this might be zero, this might be four, okay? Hmm? And threshold might still be uh, 1.2, okay? Something like that. Okay, you see, in this case, you have four edges. One, two, three, four, where you have an intersection with 1.2. And then you get, when you connect them, you connect always two points that lie on the same face. This point and this point are connected because they lie on the bottom face together. This point and this point are connected because they both, both lie on this face, and so forth. Based on that, you get the strategy for connecting these contour points. And once you have exhausted the set, the set then you have an oriented polygon. And in, the, in the tetrahedral case, you can only get triangles or quads. That's it. Not more. Okay. That's all we need to understand for contouring. Done. And now comes the more interesting stuff, right? Who talked about ray casting right away? Jennifer, right? <coughs> so you have to help me then. This was ray casting. It's more called difficult. Because that's this big book by uh, Robert Siegel, a thousand pages about heat transfer, right? Okay, ray casting. Ray casting. What is the basic principle of ray casting? What is going on there? What was the first paper that introduced ray casting into visualization? Uh, I asked you to take a bunch of papers last time, a stack of papers. Um, and Keen, will you give yours? Too? Okay. Um, what is the principle behind ray casting? So I have this translu translucent jello, this translucent medium in front of me, and light or certain electromagnetic waves are happily penetrating this medium and are going through it, right? And so the ones that are of interest are those that are in the visible part of the spectrum. Um, and that's the story. Okay, so I have a certain background color. The background color behind the green bottle is this gray stuff, right? So what I see here in front of the Im on, on the image plane, here's my image plane, my raster, right? My I IJ pixel space. I get a picture which is a combination of all this gray stuff behind the bottle, and then the green stuff, the bottle color itself, and maybe some color in the interior of the bottle. In this case, there is no color at all because there's only air in it, right? But so what I do, I shoot just like ray tracing. I shoot a ray through all the pixels in my pixel plane or image plane, and then sample the field function, the space. I sample the space and ask the question, what is the material property for each sample along the ray? And based on the property that I assign to the material, I compute ultimately a color for that pixel. And there's a bunch of magic going on, right? And this magic is called opacity, translucency, transparency, transfer function, and whatnot. And the other thing is color, color models, right? All the samples that are along the ray going through that bottle, they get illuminated right, by something, namely by these lights. Hmm? So you have to understand lighting and illumination. And at the same time, you have to understand the characteristics of this medium, the characteristics in terms of scattering, absorption, reflection, refraction, and much, much more. But all the ray, ray casting papers simplify all of that away, okay? and it becomes very simple. First paper, indeed, was a very good paper by a gentleman who was at the time at the North Carolina Chapel Hill, Mark Lavoy. Uh, he's now a professor at Stanford, and he, got, he really became famous with coming up with this, okay? And so that was the original uh, ray casting paper around 1988, 1989, um, uh, ray casting, that where, that where that term was first coined as a term in, in visualization. Ray casting, let's review that. 
rate casting. How does it work? Okay, the basic principle well, it goes back to heat transfer, but that's besides the point. Uh, this was really introduced in visualization by Mark Lavoie. Okay, and he wrote a bunch of papers on this topic. Okay, I mean, it, first paper, improving it, making it more efficient, blah, 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 some more tricks and better transfer functions. So in the uh, late 80s, early 90s, there's about 10 or 20 papers that uh, include Mark Lavoie. You should read those. Okay, that's where it all started. How does it work? So you have, I can only draw it for 2D. So you have your screen. This is your screen. And you have all these pixels. And you have your eye, the viewer, sitting here. And you need to determine, well, what is the color here, right? What is the color for this particular pixel, just like in ray tracing. But ray tracing and ray casting is very different. So you shoot this ray into space. And this space is some kind of heavy material. Okay, and so this, this, this material has some properties, and there's also a light source somewhere, a happy light source. And uh, what you do is, you say, what's the color here? What's the color there? What's the color there? What's the color there? You, you apply a Fong lighting model, say if you like Fong lighting models, to all the points along the ray, and then you average these values, right? You compute an average. That's what you do. You compute in the limit colors for all the points on the line, and then you combine them. You combine them in such a way that you consider the, the characteristics, the optical characteristics of that medium, which we don't really do because it takes forever, but we try to approximate that. So what we do, we sample, right? So we say uh, we take a bunch of sample points, and we compute the characteristics of lighting just at these locations. Okay. All right. So in the original thinking, we start numbering from the back. And so this is uh, back to front compositing. That's what it's called, back to front. Back to front compositing. Compositing. OK. And so first of all, there's this color here in the background, right? That's the background color. And the background color has an influence on the color I see here, if this thing is transparent, right? That's the whole assumption, that this medium is transparent. So I have a background color here. And so I have some kind of incoming color, which I call capital C minus 1. OK, that's just my way to index. Then I need to know what's the color when I'm here. What's my color at this location? I call that big color 0. What's my color when I'm here? I call that color 1. And so you have a bunch of color values. The last one that I want to know is this color, the color for question mark for the pixel, which I call, well, the last one, sample n, OK, color m. OK, so the, the, the capital Cs are integral qualities or properties that consider the average of all the stuff that lies already behind them. In order to get the capital Cs, you need to compute what are the local color properties, right? So you have small colors, and I call this small c0. And there is this other value in alpha, a so-called opacity. Here's a local color uh, c1 and a, an opacity 1. Here's a color 2 and an opacity 2. And here is integral color c2. Again, these are two different colors, right? c minus 1 is a background color, the color that is existing there. Then you have local colors of points in the material. These are local color qualities. Right? What is the color at this point? What's the color at this point? What's the color at this point? Hmm? But along the ray, all these small colors get averaged. right? Okay, So you need to compute the local colors in the first step. Boom, 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 boom. And then you need to compute these colors that are always the result of combining stuff. Hmm? And that's the formula. Uh, that is the famous Lavoie formula. And I will just derive it, because then you see that it's very simple. All right. Uh, because all of ray casting can be reduced to this one formula. One picture, one formula. Okay. All right. Um, I just do this by induction. Right? Whenever you have to derive 
uh, formula for n, you just develop it for c0, c1, c2, and then by the principle of induction, the general formula for arbitrary n follows. So, and we develop the Lavoie formula, Lavoie's famous formula. So, I say, what is this color? This color here that I have there, if I were to stand in the, in the material as a viewer with my eye, I'm standing here, then the color that I'm seeing there is a combination of the background color and this local color. That's the principle. When I'm standing here as a viewer and I look into the volume in that direction, then the color I'm seeing there with my eye is some kind of combination of the background color plus the local color. And that principle gets iterated, okay? So you say big color, capital C0, is, I have to say what these alpha i's are, they are so-called opacities, and it becomes clear why they are called opacities. Opacity. Uh, it is 1 minus alpha 0 times the background color, c minus 1, plus uh, alpha 0, c 0. So this c minus 1 is the background color. What does this mean? Uh, this is linear interpolation, right? Um, when alpha, um, alpha i are always between 0 and 1, didn't say that, um, they say whether something is completely opaque or completely transparent, or something in between. That's the meaning of it. One extreme is to set alpha to 0. What does it mean? When it's zero, that means the color I'm seeing is one times the background color plus nothing times local color. That means when alpha is zero, it is not opaque at all. It is entirely transparent. Huh? So when alpha is one, I see the stuff behind completely because it's glass. I'm looking through glass. Huh? Um, the other extreme is alpha is one. What does that mean? When alpha is 1, I have the other extreme. 1 minus 1, 0 times background color. So I don't see any background color. I only see 1 times the local color. Right? So when the thing is completely opaque, a black body, right? then there is no radiation getting through it. Okay? And then I have just 1 times the color I'm seeing there. Okay? And then all the other alpha values between 0 and 1 have, allow you to model some kind of transparency, translucency. Hmm? Okay, This is, of course, a big trick to determine uh, for what type of object that I model do I need what type of alpha value. That's a big magic, okay? And that's an entire research area in its own right. So this is this. Now I iterate the formula. I know how to do this. Now I know how to do C1. C1 is defined the same way. It is 1 minus alpha 1 times C0 plus alpha 1 times C1, right? The same formula, just the index has gone up by 1. But at this point, do I already know what C0 is? This is the definition of C0, right? So I plug it in there. So this is 1 minus alpha 1 times, well, what is C0? C0 is something. C0 is 1 minus alpha 0 times C minus 1 plus alpha 0 C0 plus alpha 1 C1, OK? OK. Now I can go on. Now I develop the formula for C2. What is the formula for C2? C2 equals, well, same thing. C2 equals 1 minus alpha 2 times C1 uh, plus alpha 2 times C2. And now C1 is already defined. I can plug it in there. Okay. So when I do that, then I have this is 1 minus alpha 2 times uh, uh, times this expression, 1 minus alpha 0 times C minus 1, uh, C1. Let's see. Or C minus 1, okay. C1, C1, I have to plug that in there. Uh, C2. C1, uh. 
it is 1 minus alpha 2 times expression for uh, C1. The expression for C1 is this guy. Um, 1 minus alpha 1 times uh, 1 minus alpha 0 times C minus 1 plus alpha 0 C0. Uh, first bracket is uh, plus alpha 1 C1. And second bracket plus, uh, what is it, alpha 2 C2. Okay. And now I will stop because the expressions get longer and longer. And I will just mu multiply out, and then we see the general formula. So if I multiply these things out, then I just see what I have. I collect these terms, these guys, in front of the background color. So I have 1 minus alpha 2 times 1 minus alpha 1 times 1 minus alpha 0 times the background color, this guy, C minus 1, plus, all right. Now I have the other things. Now I have this guy, uh, this times that, times that. So I have 1 minus alpha 2 times 1 minus alpha 1 times, uh, where is it? Uh, alpha naught C naught plus now this guy times that guy. I have 1 minus alpha 2 times this alpha 1 um, C1, and then the last term is just this term there by itself, plus alpha 2 C2. Okay, And there's a structure to that. Right? This thing has a structure. Okay, And the structure is there's one term here, which is a term that contains the background color. And the rest is all the stuff that is a combination of local colors, averaged or summed up or added. Okay? That's what you write down. You see one term and another term. Those are two terms. And the first one is just the product. And the rest is a sum. And you translate that into the language of mathematics. There's a product and a sum. So this is what? The first term is the background color, C minus 1. C minus 1 times a product. The product is a bunch of 1 minus alpha i values. So it's just 1 minus alpha i, right? And the i goes from, well, from 0 to, that's it. n is 2 in this case, right? Because I stopped at 2, right? I stopped by formula at 2, but in general, it goes up to n. So 2 is n. Uh, so this is i from 0 to n. OK, that is the first part, this part. And the next part is a sum of products. That's what I write down. This next part is a sum, sum of products. All right. So plus there is a sum, a sum of certain products. What are these products? The products include the alpha i times c i, alpha i times c i, alpha i times c i, starting from zero going up to n. Okay. So it's a bunch of alpha i's times c i values, and i goes from 0 to n. Okay, And this stuff is multiplied by certain 1 minus alpha j coefficients in front of them. That's a product, right? This thing has a product of 1 minus alpha in front of it. So that's the language then. It's a product of certain 1 minus alpha j's. And where does j start? Here i is 0, so j starts at 1. Here, i is 1 and j starts at 2. So that always is i plus 1. So it must be j from i plus 1. And where does it end? It always goes up to n. Okay? To n. And this is it. This is the general uh, Lavoie formula. Cn equals that. That's all there is to it. 
this is his first paper about that, okay? All you need to understand is that picture and that principle, and then putting down the first terms, right, how this formula evolves for the first couple of terms, and then you just write it down for arbitrary n, and that's it. And that's the formula you will see in Lavoie's paper. Okay, that's that. Is this good or is this bad, computationally? As computer scientists, we always would like to do something that is very fast and efficient. Okay. What is this? This is called back-to-front compositing. Okay. Why? I'm standing here as a viewer, right? And I'm looking into the volume but in order to determine what the color is that I'm seeing here, the color n, color n is the color of the pixel, what do I do? I do what physics does. Physics or nature has certain electromagnetic waves which are active here. These waves are penetrating this material, glass, or jello, whatever it is, or coke, right? It goes in here. These waves get absorbed, reflected, refracted, uh, thrown out again, whatever kind of quantum phenomena there might be that take place, which we don't really model, and then we compute a color there, a color first deepest in the volume. We start at the back, right, back to front, and we always compute the one furthest away from us first, then this one, and this one, ultimately we get the value for there. So how many samples do we have to consider? All of them, all n, okay, because that's the way the boy thought about this first, right? What is it when the color is uh, coming through this material in front of me from back to the front and reaches my eye ultimately, right? Okay, now you can reverse it. If there's something called back to front compositing, there's probably also something front to back. Okay, front to back will compute the colors closest to my eye first and then just do some computations here. Is it valid? Is it good? Can you already think why this different thinking might be better? Best Carolina, right? Best Carolina, right. Wouldn't you have to come in 3D? Yes, it's 3D. Okay. If this well, is all I, 3D. I cannot draw this bubble in 3D, okay. but... <laughs> well, there's a problem there already. You have to iterate in all three dimensions. So that... Computationally, I could see that being very slow. Yeah. This, is, this is very slow, no matter what. Okay, so, I mean, if, you use, if I use a million samples, I have to do these computations there of, the, of these products and of these sums and add it all up, right, just for one ray, just for one pixel, right? If I have a resolution of a thousand by a thousand, I have a million, right, a million pixels, which is a small display today, right? A small display. You are talking about usually 10,000 times 10,000 pixels. That's, that's a more realistic display. So you have many rays to do that. And if you use a thousand pixels, a uh, thousand points, for each ray cast in there, well, you actually need 10,000 sample points. Actually, you need a million. Actually, you need a billion because you have to get closer to the continuum behavior, right? Huh? So, and so there's many points. And these computations of those products and these alphas is a computation in its own. It's very expensive. So therefore, you do not compute all these gazillion points. What is the principle or the insight? If I have a transparent object in front of me, but it is rather opaque, it is just barely translucent, then the stuff that is very deep in the volume, far from my eye, would it have an effect on the color that I see on the screen? No, that's the inside, okay? If I have some kind of transparent medium lying in front of me, but it's nearly a black body, right? I mean, it's hardly, hard, hardly no, no color is coming out, it absorbs everything, right? If that's the case, then I will only have something like subsurface scattering, a very small little layer that I can actually see the color properties in the interior of the medium. All right, so what does it mean? I better start from my eye. And I have the, I have, I have, I have the samples start from the pixel, from the eye, and then they enter the medium. And if I'm lucky, and this is not completely transparent glass, 
then at some point, anything deeper in the volume will no longer have an effect. No? Because if, if a point is deep in the volume, and the volume is very opaque or highly opaque, whatever I compute beyond this location of my fingers, a meter away, 10 meters away, a kilometer away, that has no effect whatsoever on what I see on the screen. Right? That's the principle. And so there was back to front. That's the right physics, right? The way to compute the entire formula. It's a full formula, but you don't need that. So uh, an acceleration is you have all these rays going in there, right? And you only you only might have to compute these values, local color values, and average these to get a good picture there. And you might you might not even need layer three, layer four, layer one billion. Huh? Okay, all right. So if there's front to back, uh, accelerate. And you accelerate by turning the formula around. You do uh, front to back. And that's a real trick. Front to back, a great trick. Front to back, compositing. All right. So let me also try to derive that. So again, we have one pixel. The U is here. Um, rays going in, and again we have our bubble of highly opaque material. Right? It's good, good for highly opaque material. Uh, great for highly opaque, highly opaque, opaque materials. Right, so we do the same thing. We only want to know the color here, CN. Here's a point, here's a point, here's a point. But I don't want to go all the way in there. This, this, this stuff doesn't have any effect on the pixel, right? All this stuff close to my will have an effect. So this will be CN minus 1. The, loca local, uh, the color here is CN minus 2. And I have my local things here, my local color CN and opacity N. Local color CN minus 1 and opacity N minus 1. Local color CN minus 2 and opacity N minus 2. Okay. Now, I need to write this down again. Uh, now, instead of developing the formula, going from the back to the front, now I'm going from the beginning and work my way inwards. Okay. Uh, so... How does this work? Well, I, have, I need to know what is the value for CN. The color here is a combination of the local color there and the color behind it. Right? The color here is a combination of CN minus 1 and the local color CN. So it is 1 minus alpha N times uh, CN minus 1 plus alpha N Cn, okay, and now I iterate this formula again. Now I apply the same formula for Cn minus one. Cn minus one, the color there is a combination of Cn minus two and the local color there, okay, and I plug that in. So next step is I say this is one minus alpha n times well. Now I plug the expression in there for Cn minus one. So I have to use the same formula, but the index goes down by one, right? So this then is 1 minus alpha n minus 1 times c n minus 2 plus alpha n minus 1, c n minus 1 plus alpha n, c n. Okay. Now I have this guy in there. Now I can iterate for that. All right, so c n minus 2. What is c n minus 2? c n minus 2 is a combination of c n minus 3 and the color there. Right. And at some point, I can probably stop. This is Cn minus 3. So and I will stop after this one. So this one is now 1 minus alpha n times something. 1 minus alpha n minus 1 times, well, now I plug something in for Cn minus 2. The Cn minus 2 expression would, would read 1 minus alpha n minus 2 times Cn minus 3 plus alpha n minus 2 
cn minus 2 uh, bracket uh, plus alpha n minus 1 cn minus 1 bracket plus alpha n cn. Okay, all right, is it correct? That's correct. And I can go on and go on forever, right? Until I actually reach the end of this volume. But I don't want to do that. So now I can also write down a formula for this. And these formulas are equivalent, of course. All right. So I want the formula for arbitrary CN. And here's some K. I go K equal 3 deep. I go 3 layers deep. That's it, right? Hmm? So I want to have a formula that tells me what do I get when I go K layers deep into the volume. So here I use here uh, K equals 3. Uh, general formula. Okay, so what is it? Um, I have to multiply this thing out first to see that structure. Cn is something. Again, there are these 1 minus alpha terms, blah, 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 times this thing. I write this down first. So it is 1 minus alpha n times 1 minus alpha n minus 1 times 1 minus alpha n minus 2 times the color cn minus some k. Okay, that is this k variable, the number of layers I go in there. Uh, n minus 3, well, I, I have to leave it at this. I have to leave it at 3 for this specific case. And now come the other terms. The other terms is now this guy, this guy, and this guy. All right, this times that times that, okay? Plus 1 minus alpha n times 1 minus alpha n minus 1 times this guy, alpha n minus 2, c n minus 2, okay? Now comes this guy plus 1 minus alpha n times alpha n minus 1 cn minus 1, and then the last term is this lonely guy right there, plus alpha n cn. cn. And now again, I have written it in such a way that it's beautiful and there's a structure there, okay? Just like over there. So here is a structure. You always have to see the structure. It's a beauty. Oh, that's a trick. Structure. Okay. And so, again, this is my k in this case. I go three layers deep, okay? Now, the, arbitrary, the general formula has to, for an arbitrary, has to be for an arbitrary k, right? So three is my specific k, and now I have to write the general formula down for an arbitrary k. So k is three. So now I need to, the general formula for uh, arbitrary k, I get cn is what? There's this first term again. The first term is a product of C n minus k times some 1 minus alpha stuff in front of it. So that is C n minus k times a product of certain 1 minus, 1 minus alpha i terms, 1 minus alpha i's. And where do, they, where, they, where do they start? This is 3, so they go from 2, 1, 0, right? Okay, so it's from 0, 1, 2, k minus 1. So it goes from i from 0 to k minus 1, okay? That's the first term. And again, the next three terms is just a sum. These are sums, right, Addi adding. It's a sum of certain products, so you write this down, plus a sum. A sum of what? Here is 0, 1, 2. So 2 is k minus 1. Shoot. Uh, the index on that product, uh -huh. um, the i equals 0 isn't, is, do you mean like a sub n minus i? Because we, have, we don't. Yes, yes, yes. Uh huh. Good, good, good. All 
All right, so now what is the sum? The sum has these terms. It is alpha n minus i's times colors, c n minus i's. Okay, how does i go? i goes from 0, 1, 2, and 2 is k minus 1. So i goes from 0 to k minus 1. And then there are certain products in front of it. And so what are those products? The products are, again, certain 1 minus alpha terms. 1 minus alpha n minus j's. And we have to figure out how j is running now. So j is running from 0, right? j from 0 up to, this is my i, i minus 1 to i minus 1. And is it correct? I think so. You think so? You're in a much better position, right? <laughs> so, um, but yes, you were right. You subtract the i, so this is n minus i. Okay, n minus i. Yes, it's correct. So, So how do we use it? The following, don't copy that, okay? Don't copy the following. This is the way it works. Don't copy it. Just think about it. So I have my volume, right? I have my screen. I'm looking from here. And this is a transparent medium, right? There's light, electromagnetic waves coming through there. And I just want to know what is the color on the screen. I don't care what the color is deep in the volume. I only need to know what's the color close to my eye, if the thing is highly opaque. So therefore, I compute colors here. Maybe another layer in here, right? I get an updated picture. The first picture I get is just using these colors. Then I also consider the colors one layer in, two layers in, three layers in. And the, the colors will change, but they will change less and less the more I add. Why? Because I go deeper and deeper into the volume, hmm? and it hardly has any effect. I add more, and then I stop. Because if I were to add the colors here, it would not change my RGB integer space anyway, right? Right? You only have RGB from 0 to 255. At some point, if you consider the color properties here, one kilo kilometer away from me, does, I don't see that. It has no effect. Huh? So you start from the beginning, and you add these. You add these, you add these, and here you stop. Right? For k equals 3. Done. You don't do layer 4, layer 5, layer 6. Huh? Of course, if this is glass, right, or highly transparent, then you have to go deep in there because uh, then you're in bad luck. Okay, that's how that works. So, and this this is the uh, this is the idea. This uh, term here has no effect at some point any longer, right? At some point, this term is very small, and when that's the case, you stop you go to the next pixel, instead of going all the way through the volume, right? Hmm? All right. But again, that's all in the voice papers. Um, Okie doke. What do we need to do? And then we stop. Um, what else? Four. Raycasting. What else must be done? So in the first assignment case, now I'm going very slowly. I'm building it, building this lectures up toward the first assignment. Right? So uh, somewhere I have a very nice Cartesian medical data set. Okay, something like that. And somewhere I will put my uh, screen, right, of resolution 1024 by 1024. 
and I will compute colors for that. Therefore, what do I have to do? I should array through all my cells. And for the first assignment, there will be very simple cells, namely nice uniform cubes okay, of unit volume. Here is my array. In order to get the color for this guy, for this pixel, here is the viewer. Um, I either do back to front or front to back compositing. That is ir irrelevant right now. What do you need? No matter what, you need to compute the local colors, right? You need to compute the local colors at any point along your ray, wherever, either at the front of the volume or deep in the volume or at the end of the volume. What do you need to do there? How do you get a local color? How do you get this color here? Color I. Color I equals what? Where does it come from? How do you compute a color for a point in a solid? Pardon? You have to interpolate something, right. Let's go back to computer graphics. What is the most essential illumination or lighting model? You need a phone lighting model, right? So somewhere you have usually the surface. You have the normal vector, right? You remember that? You have a light source. You have a light vector. Then you have a reflection vector. This is a normal vector. This is a light vector. Here is your reflection vector, R. And then here is your viewing vector, right, toward the viewer. Here is your view vector. Right? L, N, V, R. Right? These are light, uh, normal, uh, viewing or view vector and reflection vector, refo vectors, right? Based on this information, the point, there's a normal there, there's a light vector there, there's a reflection vector there, and there's a viewing vector there. You can compute color, right? That's just the illumination of surfaces with color properties, right? Okay, you have to associate a color property to that point in that medium. That's another issue, right? So you do, you apply, use the Fong lighting model, right? Use Fong, Fong model, model to compute, compute local color, local color, CI. Okay. What is, the, what is uh, the most important aspect of the whole computation? What factor will be the most important one to determine what the local color is? Remember that? From, this is essential computer graphics. Which vector is the most important one? And changing, changing that vector will influence all the rest more than anything else. The normal. Okay, the orientation of the surface that is being illuminated is the most important one. This guy is important. And in volume rendering or ray casting, the normal is equated or set equal to what? You did volume visualization. Uh, the gradient. The gradient, right. Where does it come from? Why is it, why is it the same? The normal is a gradient. The gradient becomes the normal, right? Where is the surface? There is no surface. I have a volume. Where, the, where is the surface anyway? Where is the normal of what? Okay, it's, it's, it's a gradient. Just use the gradient. The gradient is the normal. So we talk about that next time. But anyway, last remark, last remark is just that we need to be very careful with computing great gradients or normals to get great pictures, OK? So the important observation is this one, important. The important part is this. Um, the normal, the normal, normal at this location, bullet um, is equal to, not really, but I'll say it like that, equal to the gradient, the gradient, gradient at that location, at this location. If that's the case, we have to make sure that we compute very, very good high quality gradients. Otherwise, all of our pictures will be screwed up. Therefore, need very good gradient estimation schemes. Need very good, very good 
very good gradient estimation schemes. Gradient, gradient estimation. Okay, and we will do that next time, and we'll be happy when we know how to do that. All right, thank you.